Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to this afternoon's second uh, elective uh, session uh, with Simon. Um, just the, the, the housekeeping, if I have missed anybody in the room at the end, could you just make sure you um, give me a nudge, just to make sure I tick you off so that you get the um, CPD um, uh, letter, that was all. So um, it, it's a pleasure um, to introduce Simon Nelson, um, a Sussex officer, but um, the primary reason why he's here today is to share with um, some of his experiences and advice uh, in his role as the Vice President of the Disabled Police Association. Um, his full details are on the bio on, on, on the app, so I'm not going to waste time going through that now because time's precious. Um, but just um, going through the session, Simon's um, keen that if there are any questions or observations you want to make, please feel free um, as we go through the session um, to, to either ask them or, or make a comment as we go through. Simon. Thanks, Andy. I can't believe they put me on after Sophie. It's just like, <laughs> it's like when, I, when I originally saw the schedule, I thought, great, I haven't got the graveyard shift. After they've had a big lunch and they're a bit stoned, and then Sophie, all the energy. So if, if you could stay awake, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd consider it a, a, a personal... One life did it, Simon. Well, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, welcome everyone. Really appreciate you, you coming along for this conversation. It, it is a conversation. I am, I am not, as you will find out, I'm not a lecturer. Um, what I, and I'm not an expert in this field, I'll point that out now, but what I do have is I have a lot of lived experience and I have a real passion for diversity, particularly with respect to disability. Won't through, go through my personal experience, but it, there's some stuff there in the bio. Um, and as I put on the top there, it's about a conversation. That's, that's ideally what I'd like in here. You already, already have some ideas, you already have some thoughts. This is an opportunity just to throw them up in the air and see which order they land down and, and see if there's some other considerations to take away with you after conference. So just to, just to briefly go through what we're, what we're going to cover, bearing in mind also we're a little bit behind time and I want to make sure that, that you're back on time. We're just as a reference point, we're just going to have um, some consideration around, around the term no normal. Um, we're going to look at... Um, we're going to touch on different areas of disability in the broadest sense, but it won't surprise you to know that I'm going to focus a little bit on disability because what I usually find to be the case is that's an area where perhaps, unless people have it as part of their personal experience in life, it's an area where people don't know perhaps quite so much. Um, some consideration around what we like to see in our people. I suspect the majority of people in, in the room are, are senior leaders. And, and have a bit of time to reflect on, on our attitudes to them, what we see as, as desirable traits. Um, bit of consideration around needs in common. That is not me trying to be deep and meaningful. That is a typo, need in common there. It is just, just some sort of thinking about what it is that's, that's important to all of us. Um, power of conversation. And then just to, just to wrap up, a bit of a consideration about what role we have what part do we have to play going forwards? There may be a few ideas uh, as to how you might progress with some of those. Um, one of the things I need to point out is that helpfully, uh, conference has provided slides that, that are pretty dyslexia friendly. Um, but if anybody needs anything in a bigger font or, or in a different format, just let me know afterwards. Uh, my understanding is that all the presentations are going to be provided at the end of end of conference anyway, if you need to refer to anything. Um, yeah, and, and just please shout up with any questions along the way. As I, as I say, you know, I start to get bored of, with my own voice. So if anybody would like to chip in with any questions or short, um, any, any questions or thoughts, please do so. Um, most of the font size is a pretty pretty big 16 plus there's one slide with a pie chart but I'll be referring to the key points on that anyway so um, reflecting on normal if you if various different types or formats versions of different dictionaries will give a very similar different definition and there's there's no trick question in this but I'd just like to get an indication from everybody in the room as to who considers themselves to be normal 
correct answer. As I say, it's not a trick answer, but it, but it, it just gives, it, it gives us that reference point at, at the beginning and just being really comfortable with a se sense of authenticity and all of us being unique, unique backgrounds. You know, there are times, particularly in my national role, where I'll go and give presentations and you can see, see the minds where it's just like, it's disabled? What's, what's that all about? It's like, white guy, tall, he's walking around. How does that work? It's far more complex than that. We're far more complex as individuals. When you, when you have a proper conversation, we'll talk about having proper conversations in a little while. When you get to know people, you get into discussions. So if somebody has a discussion with me, even prior to disability, they would have known that half my family is Jewish on my mother's side. And in fact, it was only in, at the point of 12 when I considered that where I actually understood that that might be some sort of issue because I shared it with several members of my class at school and, and then I had cause to fight because I, you, you don't realise what lies beneath in terms of attitudes and families, etc. It is, you know, society is a fantastic place, but it's worth just, just recognising that there are things that lurk beneath as well. So this, as I say, it's a useful reference point when we come on to discuss uh, Id identity, belonging, uh, the risk of inequality and discrimination. And um, what I thought would be useful in terms of disabilities is just to consider how things may actually look in a medium-sized force. Uh, this was a piece of work where the Dis Business Disability Forum supported us in terms of the breakdown of how things could look uh, compared to national st statistics. So we've got a number of employees is 5,490. Um, a couple of things that really stood out to me is when we look at the figure of 458, in terms of 458 will consider themselves disabled and 458 would ask for a reasonable adjustment. Now, those figures, to me, those figures are very, very interesting because there is arguably um, a case there for or people reaching a crisis point before they actually ask for reasonable adjustments, i.e. I'm not going to tell anyone that I'm disabled unless there's a really good reason to. And we'll talk about resilience and where that, where that tipping point may be. Um, the other thing that I find around the country as well is, is there is a massive amount of underreporting in terms of disability. Um, most forces report uh, extremely low levels of those who are prepared to talk about it. Um, unfortunately, it's not helped by the fact that very often you'll hear words like disclose their disability or declare their disability. It's very, very easy around diversity sometimes to sort of latch on to language and things like that, but sometimes it, 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 it sort of paints a picture that doesn't really encourage those to come forward and have those conversations. So it'd just be a whole lot more positive if there could be some mention of discussing and sharing and creating an environment where they're willing to come forwards and have those conversations and actually be proud of that identity. I think it's also useful to touch on, on some, how, how they identify as well, because some of them will identify with being disabled, some will identify as having impairments, and then there are others that are proud of their neurodiversity, may sit on the autistic spectrum, etc. So it's just as part of those conversations, nothing complex about that. It's just simply, as I say, through having, going back to the earlier slide, a conversation with the people that we work, work with. Um, there are also additional conditions that fall within that. Um, I mean, very often it comes to the definition under the uh, Equality Act in terms of those substantial and lifelong conditions, but it can be dormant conditions as well, such as, dis um, such as depression is one example of a dormant condition where it might not be at the fore sometimes, but, but other times there's not. Um, it has been shown in the past to include, the, and these unfortunately come about as a result of court cases when things go wrong, um, things like stuttering, allergies in, in their more, more extreme forms as well. 10% there, 
um, i.e. 549, <coughs> excuse me, um, have mental health conditions. And, and one of the things that's been really heartening to see in terms of our service and nationally and locally is the amount of support that's now offered and the increased understanding and less stigma that there was around mental health conditions. Positives around that is, is that we ended up with a national strategy for mental health in policing. There is a, there's a dedicated MPCC lead, an APP, a two-day national conference, and there are also seconded officers to the College of the Policing to deal with that. Really positive stuff, lots more to do in terms of disability as a whole, which, which I'll come on to. So in terms of touching specifically on disability in policing, <coughs> there it is, um, is an area uh, in terms of protected characteristics where we're really playing catch up. There is, there is a real lack of understanding around it and some underlying unconscious bias and, and prejudice, unfortunately, as well. So we, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, going back to what I said about mental health in policing, <coughs> sorry, when I was talking about mental health in policing, we compare and contrast in terms of disability. Unfortunately, there is not a disability strategy. There's not an APP. There's not a national conference. There is not a sole MPCC lead for disability. Uh, there's an MPCC lead who, who, who is responsible for disability and gypsy traveller and Roma. Um, but unfortunately, bearing in mind the numbers that we're talking about, there isn't, there isn't that um, level of um, executive support. Excepting that within individual forces and by negotiation, very often there are chief officers who step forward and, and, and want to provide some level of support. So just touching briefly on Disabled Police Association, we are all volunteers. So we all, we all have a day job. Um, outside of that, we try to do this. Um, we have absolutely no national funding. Uh, we have no permanent national officers. And uh, DCC Morgan, who I think comes from Ministry of Defence, is it? Wilson, sorry. Yeah, DCC Wilf Wilson has taken a paper to uh, Police Chiefs Council in January suggesting that there should maybe be dedicated national roles for each of the protected groups so that there is some consistency because I, I, I have to be honest, as, as a committee, we, um, we do creak sometimes in terms of, and there are a couple of occasions where we've been close to folding. Um, because, and, and this is something I'd like you to take away in terms of your local associations as well, the difference, the, there isn't a hierarchy, there shouldn't be a hierarchy in terms of protected characteristics, but by, by its very na nature, very often disability includes fatigue as part of that because of what's needed to manage those conditions. So you know, your networks need uh, an awful lot of support, please, if, uh, if you could. Um, and of course, within the Disabled Police Association falls the Police Dyslexia Association and National Police Autism Association as well, sort of comes, comes within, within our umbrella. One of the things that's, that's really useful to acknowledge is the rub in our service in terms of diversity versus capability. So in terms of disability, it comes straight back to the Pedian principles that we've talked about quite a lot in various different sessions, police being the public and the public being the police. There needs to be, a, I'd argue, there needs to be a disabled community in, within police staff and police officers to represent the public out there. Um, but unfor unfortunately, recent changes, particularly within regulations and specifically the X factor and capability dismissal, um, unfortunately are a real threat to retention. Um, and do I think that was anticipated at the, at the outset? No, I don't. I think, I think it was just, if, and it's my opinion, I'm open to challenge, it was a poor quality impact assessment. It's an un unintended consequence, but I think it's a, a consequence we need to address now and we need to ask ourselves some searching questions in terms of what we're prepared to sacrifice, which we'll, we'll come on to in a little while. And I think we need to ask ourselves a question in terms of certain roles, what is actually required? 
So in terms of particularly different ranks, different roles, in terms of the people in this room, how many of us are actually required as part of our jobs to chase and detain, for example? Now, there might be occasionally some of us who go out there and engage with the front line and uh, manage to get there first, but that's, that's extraordinary circumstances. So I think, I think we need to challenge that, or even what's required of our PCs. Because don't get me wrong, we need to have a mobile capacity. We have PSU uh, regional commitments, national commitments, that kind of thing. But how many people do we actually need to go and do that? On a day-to-day -day basis, it's a very, very different world out there in terms of protective equipment. And realistically, how many times people, police officers actually have to chase and detain. So we need to have, need to have those discussions. One of, the, one of the things that's also useful to bear in mind and actually links back to that pie chart that I showed you prepared by the BDF is actually in terms of disabled people, only 17% were born with that condition. Most of them as a, as a result of a, a, a significant illness or, or injury have become disabled along the line or for positive reasons being diagnosed with something such as dyslexia which they didn't know when they were younger and wondered why they were struggling at school. So I don't know if we've we got anybody from West Mids here. Okay, there's West Mids, their, um, their ACC, Chris Johnson, was fairly, fairly recently diagnosed with motor neurone disease. I don't know if anyone's seen any of his, um, any of video clips, interviews, etc. Really, from the heart, inspiring stuff and a, and a reminder to all of us, with, without being down about this, that realistically things happen. Someone also know really well, really nice guy in, in uh, Thames Valley, Colin Payne, Chief Superintendent, head of PSD being diagnosed with ME. His reasonable adjustments are at the certain times of the day where he, his energy just falls through the floor and he has to go, go and have two hour lay down, recharge, come back, comes back and then is, is you know, one, of, one of the best people in our rank that I've ever met in terms of commitment, knowledge, etc. So we, we, we need to continue to have those discussions around what is referred to in certain circles as fully deployable capacity. It's, we've got a... Simon, um, if you cover it later, then, then zoom straight over it. But sure. Just around the fitness test, do, is there any sort of work, work or discussion on that and the, and the link into this? Because I, I just, there's a real resonance that um, pe people can do 99.999% of the job. Yeah. We don't, we're not doing PSU every day of the week, yet the the reliance on the fitness test as a sort of a milestone in somebody's competence. And I just wondered sure. if that was within the debate. Well, there's two, there's two different elements to the fitness test. There is the requirement. So there's, there's a whole discussion around that and whether, whether it reflects the job that everyone does, particularly bearing in mind different roles, etc. You know, being, being brutal about this, you know, in, in years to come, and I hope for, hopefully it will be a long way away, um, is Chris Johnson going to be asked to do the fitness test, which I'd argue is fundamentally wrong. The other side of it is the consequences. So in terms of the X factor and capability dismissal, which, which are both part regulations would be familiar to, to colleagues from, from the districts and some of the conversations that have been had. And I sit on the capability, <coughs> Excuse me, okay, but never eat a sweet when you're doing a presentation. That is, I think someone told me that years ago. I obviously ignored it. Um, I sit on the capability dismissal working group at the Home Office with the independent chair, sit on it with, with Dan Murphy. And we, we have conversations around that and the X Factor um, before that. Um, as everybody would be aware, X Factor was potentially going to take away 8% of, of the salary of officers, um, which was supposed to be that, that operational sort of element to salary. Um, fortunately, because of discussions, that seems to have gone in a draw. It hasn't gone away. It's gone in a draw. It's still in regs, still could be taken out again. Capability is, is a very, very different kettle of fish because that can lead to dismissal. So those discussions are being had. So the, there's two elements of that. There is, because the fitness test is, is the instrument that could lead to the others, and we will also touch on some of the consequences 
around that as well, what that, that, what that could mean to individuals. Does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just in terms of, as I say, there, there's, there's some stats around this which I think offer a useful context. Um, some are more obvious than others. I'll give you a bit of a clue, but I'm getting a bit bored with my own voice. If we make it's just a little more interactive, and please, th there is genuinely no silly answers. This, 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 this is genuinely supportive. The 16% plus is a national statistic. Would anybody like to? Sixteen percent of the population, or sixteen percent in relation to the national population. Sorry. No, but it could have been, could be close. There's one more guess. Go on, just on them all. The morning group are really interactive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I didn't. I didn't get a single one. So thank you. I'll put you out of your misery. Sixteen percent percent plus. Is, is the percentage of working age adults that are disabled in the UK. So 16, 6%, it's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Um, police service, the amount of people, apparently the amount of people in the police service is about 4%. It's not, it's not. So in terms of the PDM principles, if we really want to be truly representative, that would be our aspiration. Sometimes when I talk to politicians and very, very senior people, they're all very, very, data hungry aren't they they all want to see the feels like okay so your disabled police association how many people do you represent and like how do you, well if we go by the people who don't have the confidence to come forward it's four percent if we go by the people that we we need to encourage to come forward and be proud of that identity i'll tell you about that and we'll we'll come on to that in a bit as well 44 percent is more in relation to the police workforce and it's been provided by the police federation any guesses? No, it is it is is even it's even more striking than that. It it, it is actually, and, and I can see can see the rationale between all of those. This is one of the things that hit me hardest the most over recent years. That is the amount of police employment tribunals that have been down to disability which I, I, was, I was astounded, well, I was astounded in one sense, in another sense, because of what I hear sometimes from around the country. Um, I'm not so astounded. 46.3% uh, compared to 76.4%, uh, that's national as well, society, rather than police, comparing disabled people to those who aren't. Any guesses? Working. Yeah. Yeah. So 46.3 disabled people um, are in, in full-time employment or in employment, um, any sort of employment. 76.4 of those without disabilities are in employment. Um, so when we talk about capability dismissal, that's not only are we going to exit, or say we, is the organisation potentially, potentially going to exit people with the term capability dismissal, but they're going to go into that sort of job market, which is, and I know there's a business imperative around this, you know, there's, you know, there are balances to be struck, but if people use conversation in their normal conversation, that diversity is a golden thread and the people are our most important resource somewhere within there, there, there is that, there is that driver, I'd suggest. Uh, circa two, two fifty thousand, um, world history. That one. Any ideas on that one? It's it's a bit of a tougher that one. It's, it's one part of the reason that anyone doesn't know about it is because it's not talked about a great deal. That is the amount of disabled men, women, and children killed by the Nazi regime between 1939 and 1945. It's just that, just that. Reminder, we, because we, we don't, very often in the modern age, we don't talk so much about the, um, the Allport the all um, scale of prejudice. Um, there's only five levels. You know, it starts off with that bottom level of anti-locution and, and, and the bad mouthing. 
And I just wonder, and this isn't for a show of hands, honestly, I don't want any awkwardness around this. I wonder how many people in the room have heard the term the sick, the lame and the lazy mm -hmm. during, during their, their career. In the same way, in the context of other protected <coughs> groups, um, people are described as being stroppy just because they've come from a certain protected group, just because of the fact they have strong opinions about something and, and directive. Or someone has a chip on their shoulder. It's surprising after the way that they've been treated that they're actually turning around and saying, actually, this is wrong. I've put up with this for too long. Just a, just a few thoughts. Um, next one, we, we, had, we had a discussion around normal. Um, it's also quite useful for us just to give, have some reflection, some consideration around resilience. And this is um, this maybe sort of links in a little bit to the, the discussion about... Um, about well-being that's going to follow from this when we when we go back in so it's it's i think it's really useful to consider our attitude to resilience um as, as up there you know is an endurance test um is what's required absolutely necessary going going back to the role um is there a sense sometimes of well i had to deal with it so so you deal with it i fought you know i fought my way through really should have it. nothing to do that whatsoever um, if we're going if we're going to present it as an endurance test then how does that sit with well-being how does that sit with being being protective there's there's a, a natural rub there in terms of conversations that take place out there how much passive aggression is there in terms of oh so you can't do that oh so you, you can't pick that up all right okay it's, it's this, those nuances and subtleties in language that, that we really have to address. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in our gift, as we'll come on to talk about. So in, in terms of specifically disabled colleagues, one of the things that continues to inspire me nationally is both the, the courage, persistence of, um, of disabled colleagues both in terms of disabled colleagues but also those who care for those who are disabled as well um, there is so much that goes on behind the scenes that they do to manage their own challenges their own conditions conditions of others so going back to the reasonable adjustments that's usually when they when the straw you know when the, the straw is breaking the camel's back when they ask for that um, very often i pick up from other people nationally in conversations get a bit of a sense of you know, these people trying to get away with something, you know, I have to work night shifts. You know, why shouldn't they work night shifts? Why, why should they have an extra four days off a year for some forces? They're, they're really forward thinking and have, well, forward thinking, it's a modern age. Should have happened anyway. Disability leave. So if you've got individuals that have to have maintenance treatment every year and end up with, for example, horrendous side effects, for the sake of giving them an extra four days off a year, they come back. They're fully, fully engaged, productive, feel value, um, and we'll come on some of that, that stuff around, around capacity. And reasonable adjustments come in different forms, but most of them are free, and certainly 90% of them are £100 or less for the sake of making sure that, that somebody can, can thrive in their role, not, not just about try and get, get by. So these, you know, these are, these are important considerations, and sort of in part my part of my day job. I don't always agree with the CPS, and the CPS don't always agree with me. But I do agree with them on this one, in terms of their staff network and what they say in terms of the ability of disabled colleagues to find practical solutions to problems and barriers, and they have the creative solving skills. Um, I come across this regularly in terms of, you know, that that flex they, that they have. So as I say, in terms of resilience, that's resilience to me. Um, this next one is really, next slide is, is to sort of come back to the whole sense of needs in common, what's really important to all of us. And, and I think this is, this is optimal distinctiveness theory by, by Brewer, and it's massively oversimplified by myself, but there's a reference and the final slide is a reference if you want to look into it more fully um, or in a fuller sense. Um, one, of the, one of the things for me, this, 
this red, it's all right, it's just, excuse me, on, on the hop, it's just really something that really chimed with me um, in Sophie's presentation is, is the, the whole Ju the Zeus quote, why fit in when you have to stand out, when it, why fit in when you're born to stand out? Um, this kind of explains some of that to me because what, what this says is that there's two basic needs for, for all of us. One of these is actually there is a need for us to fit in. We want to fit in. We want to feel like we belong. But there's also part of us that wants to stand out. We want to feel different. So when you get that balance between the two, that's when someone's needs are, are truly satisfied, happy in the workplace, happy in life, etc. I haven't got any time to go into this in any great detail today, but you know, if you, as I say, if you, if you want to look into it, please do. But in terms of the title of the presentation today, um, I think it really helps to make, make the case for leading with difference. It's, and going back, reflecting back to our discussion around normal, this is, um, you know, the, the, I'm open to challenge, but the case for difference to me is, is strong. So there is a need, sort of moving forward, there is a need to have those powerful conversations. We, we were, this, no, I didn't want this presentation or this workshop discussion to be all doom and gloom. The challenge is massive, but we work with some incredible people. We work with some amazing individuals. There are some supervisors, leaders at every level that I meet who are absolutely fantastic bosses, but it's inconsistent. It's all dependent, it seems, on the emotional intelligence and the attitude of that individual that they go to. Um, it is a bit of a leadership lottery, and um, we have to do so much better nationally in terms of how we take care of people, retain people, and make sure they don't get broken. Um, one of the things that I've observed is, is the power of a question asked twice. So if, if we can do with our teams as much as possible in those conversations, get them to, how shall I put it? Very often in a discussion, they will turn around and say, so what more can I do to help you to do your job better? Or to help you to really, really thrive in, in your role? And usually that will result in a supportively dismissive sort of response. Oh, I'm all right, that's fine. Well, nothing I think, I just about. Is, is incredible how much more you get if you ask it. No, seriously, it really, really help if you could tell me what it is, what else do you need, what else you need. And this isn't just in relation to disability and reasonable adjustments. This is for a whole host of different things, which, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, the same actually applies to to us as leaders in the room when we have those conversations it may well be that we're giving a sort of review a pdr sort of discussions when you ask a question so what can you feed back to me to help me with my development and sometimes we might be guilty of sort of asking that and then going oh nothing much i don't think on the whole so then we feel really comfortable right okay relax you ask it a second time you get honesty and you get some, some really useful stuff to, to help with your own development as well. Um, there, is, there are needs that go across all protected groups um, and others as well. Um, and I actually prefer the term workplace adjustments rather than reasonable adjustments because it, it traverses so many of the protected groups. So is, there is that, that sense of asking those questions but then in terms of individual needs, what do individuals need? It might be something in relation to caring for someone who's disabled. It might be somebody who's disabled. It might be parental pressures. Um, it may well be faith-based. You know, a colleague might get a lot of strength from their faith and just wants adjustment to be able to do that, to, to be able to go and worship at certain times. And some forces um, actually uh, have put together some work, workplace adjustment passports where what they're doing is they actually have a document so there's that conversation so there's a mechanism with the supervisor to have that conversation it gets captured if they move on to another role it then prompts a conversation as part of normal business it makes difference normal 
and then it also it's it's in terms of the awkwardness of the conversation it's it's not it's not it, it doesn't take uh, shall we say a crisis or something a little bit less to actually prompt that conversation it's and it also avoids that avoids the, that hierarchy of protected characteristics as well is like what's most important what, what we're going to pitch where it's, it's just about supporting the difference i think one of the things in terms of unlocking abilities and capacity one of the things for for those you know we we, we have to consider the business benefits as well you know we operate in an environment where we where we have to deliver if there's one thing I could take, I'd ask you to take away today or just to consider is that this is a, a massive opportunity to unlock capacity. There, there is so much, just in terms of the disability world, there's a lot of focus on the word disability and what it often forgets is, is the, the massive amount of abilities that individual has. So just for the sake of a small investment and a bit of allowance and a bit of flex, you get the full capacity of that individual in the organisation and everything they have to deliver. That person, in terms of their faith, who has the time to go and worship, you get, and you get that buy-in as well, in term, and also you get the discretionary effort, which I, I think sometimes is, is, is undervalued. I think one of the things that would be really useful to mention is at the, at the end there I mentioned about spiky profiles and neurodiversity. Um, for those who haven't heard of spiky profiles, it very often um, relates to those with neurodiversity because in terms of assessments um, against different skills areas, um, those with neurodiversity might score highly in certain areas or lower in terms of the mean. Um, so, not exclusively, it may well be that somebody with Asperger's doesn't score very well with empathy, but they score extremely highly with attention to detail. So there are some organisations um, such as the Home Office that have actually been really forward thinking with this kind of thing. So they've had people applying for jobs in the organisation, they've actually signposted them. They've actually done an assessment and they've, they've said, you've gone for that role, but to be honest with you, we think you'll be cracking in this one. And they've put them into that role and they've thrived in that. So we just, we just, there's an opportunity, opportunity to be really on the front foot with that. So which, what sort of part do each of us have to play? Um, there was someone who, who once said, and apologies for forgetting who it was, that... Um, that culture is not an accidental phenomena, it's a product of leadership. I just wonder how many people have been in a meeting when someone's turned around and said, well, the problem is culture we're dealing with, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm really sorry, but it's been down. To You've helped to shape that culture, and it doesn't matter what level that you're working at, I'm afraid you've got a responsibility in that. And probably, I would suggest most of us in, in the room are, are those designers of culture. So there's work to do when we leave. Not to suggest that it's not already in flight, but there, there's, more, there's more that can be done. So moving on to the next one. Uh, this, for those of you that, that want, need a frame or would like to have a framework, and I'm sure there's some characters in the room that want, want something to hang this on and to actually have something tangible to take forward. Um, this is a model by um, Dr. Robert W. Livingstone, um, who is from the Harvard School of Leadership. I heard him speak at the Roffey Institute, so it was, it was Horsham rather than Harvard, but that's probably more in keeping with my level of intelligence. Um, but th I, this really chimed with me in, in terms of you get a lot of conversations around divert diversity and a, a lot of genuine good meaning and aspiration, but how do you actually make it happen? And I think this framework is particularly helpful, particularly in terms of that final, final one there, sacrifice. That long, hard, searching question around what am I prepared to give up? As an organisation, if diversity is really important to us, or in, in my team, if it's really important, am I prepared to invest? Am I prepared to put the effort in? Or are there any trade-offs? 
So in terms of things like X factor, capability dismissal, that kind of thing, those conversations, well actually, if diversity and, and protected groups being representative in our organisation is really important, then what's, what's the trade-off? What, what, where am I prepared to step back and go, actually, fair enough, okay. Um, disability confident, for those who aren't aware, weren't aware, replaced two ticks as an accreditation, so forces can go for three different levels. Top level includes uh, external accreditation by the BDF. All I'd say is that I'd really encourage you to, for those of you who have staff disability networks, and, and unfortunately they aren't in every force, but please really engage with those networks and have proper conversations about how things can be improved because what disability confident will give you is, is it will give the accreditation to show that there's high level of compliance in terms of the Equality Act, but certainly the feedback that the BDF give to a lot of forces, congratulations, you, you have this accreditation, now it's business of hearts and minds. Go out there, go, go beyond compliance, actually make it an environment where disabled colleagues thrive and, and actively contribute with all of the abilities that they have. So, on to the final slide for, for my bit. Um, I just love that Brenny Brown quote. Imperfections are not inadequacies. They remind us that we're all in this together. And this kind of takes us back to the beginning with our discussion around normal. And just, just you know, really to value authenticity. And sometimes authenticity is, is, is seen as a band around as a negative thing now, because I think people misinterpret it as people speak in their minds. No, it's, it's not. It's about creating an environment where people are confident to be themselves and to bring everything to the table that, that's unique to them. Um, in terms of uh, Disability History Month, when you go away from here, I'd encourage you to think about November and perhaps if there's anything to take away, whether it be in terms of your CPD points or, or whatever it may be. Um, I, I, it was just really lucky that the title for this year's theme for Disability History Month was around leadership, resistance and culture because it links very nicely with the, with the subject of, of today's, today's workshop. So um, please feel free to find out more about that. Um, we've got about five minutes, I think, a few minutes for a couple, a couple of questions. But what I will say is please feel free. I'm, I'm here till tomorrow lunchtime. Feel free to tap me up for, for, more, um, for more of a conversation. Anything you want to ask me whatsoever, I have no problem with that, whether in terms of my circumstances or whether it's about anything that's been covered today. Um, those are just a few references. As I say, the, um, the slides should be available after the conference, but happy to take any questions for anyone. An observation, really. Many years ago, I did some work with uh, PSNI and... Uh, as a result of some of the, the injuries that their officers had incurred during the troubles, they they dealt with this issue and they'd actually had officers in wheelchairs and everything operating within the environment. And at that time, I thought, ah, oh, great, we've actually, this will be a, a real good example of how we can move forward. And it, clearly, we haven't. Yeah. We still don't treat people around their ability, but focus on their disability. That's a good point. Thank you. Dollar. In another observation, I know you mentioned a couple of times about the um, hierarchy of protected characteristics. Um, so for those that know, I'm from the National Black Police Association. So I find it sometimes used to kind of divide us, which is my concern about it being used, in that we all have, we all share a number of protected characteristics. Uh, and we talk about intersectionality quite a lot, don't we, when we speak about these things. And so actually, we, I think we work better, together better on this. Neither do we have any uh, funding as such, and we don't have any permanent offices, but like you, I think it would be helpful if it was taken seriously. And some money was put into that. I, I agree, and um, I regret that we haven't had to have had a proper conversation yet, which we'll, we'll rectify many times, I, I really hope. Um, I absolutely agree. I think um, there is another side to that as well, where when I turned around and said, when asked nationally, why isn't there a strategy? 
why is there no strategy in terms of disability and police now? So, well, I think we can wrap it up in one. We can wrap it up in one. You'll, you'll recognise, you wait, you wait. When the new strategy comes out, it will cover it all. And, and I think very often these things are done with the best of intentions. But the reality is um, there is so much that we have in common, but there is so much in terms of each of our groups where we have particular challenges or particular needs. And I think we need to find something that strikes that balance between embracing difference and diversity while supporting each of the groups and the particular struggles that, that they face. Actually struggles, I'm gonna take that back because I, do you know what? It's a bugbear of mine, you set me off now. You see, the, you know, I've, I've heard that phrase, someone struggles with a condition. No, they don't struggle with a condition. They live, they live with that decision and very often it's through no fault of their own that, that, that there is a crisis of some sort. I'll, I'll be quiet there. Take one more question. Hi. The BDF slide was really compelling, I thought, with the sort of national statistics to the workforce. How was that commissioned? Is that something that the BDF might be up for doing for any number of forces, or was that through a specific... Yeah, there would be. I mean, I, I for a number of years now, well, I was chair of my local staff network and now co-chair with another colleague. We've do doubled up to increase our resilience, um, particularly with me doing more of the national work. We simply asked we work closely with them. So um, they're very open to that sort of work. Um, and I think they, first of all, they did it with the Federation. Um, we found out through the one that we saw that the Federation had provided. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll be, they're open to those conversations. If, if you, and I'll encourage anyone to have a conversation with them because they, they genuinely want to help and make a, uh, make a difference. So, we off for time, Andy? Yeah, that's, um, that's spot on. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, th thank, thank you very much indeed. I, I'm sure uh, everybody will agree. That was um, very compelling and very, very thought-provoking. So um, please, if you'd join with me and thank Simon in the usual way.